episode 41 of What to Think, VentureBeat's weekly technology podcast. I'm Dylan Tweeney, the editor of VentureBeat. I'm here with... Ruth Reeder. <laughs> reporter at VentureBeat. That's me. And this week we're going to be talking to Paul Vigna, one of the co-authors of the book The Age of Cryptocurrency, How Bitcoin and Digital Money Are Challenging the Global Economic Order. It is a really interesting looking book. Paul and his co-author are writers at the Wall Street Journal, and they just dive deep into the economics uh, and the technology and the history and the community around Bitcoin. So we're going to talk with Paul all about that. But first, let's look at some tech news highlights from the last week on VentureBeat.com. Let's start with you, Ruth, uh, and this this uh, SpaceX story. Okay, sounds good. So this week, Google confirmed that it contributed to this like billion dollar round in SpaceX, and it contributed along with Fidelity and both. Uh, Google and Fidelity will collectively own around 10% of the company. But this is something we had known, but Google confirmed it. But what's really interesting about it, I think, is that, you know, Google, as as always, is always investing in these ways to get internet around the world, right? Mm. Um, and so with SpaceX, the idea is to reboot this idea for putting satellites in low orbit mm -hmm. around the world and using those to sort of beam down internet. Not unlike its project Loon. Yes, the, the high altitude balloons. Yes, the high Loon, altitude A loony balloons. idea for sure. For sure. So you think they're investing in SpaceX because they want orbiting spaceships that can beam internet down to us. Yes. And that's worth $900 million to them. That is worth $900 million. That's impressive. It's not surprising, though, because they dump money into this stuff all the time. I mean, look at its, you know, the, the, the fiber optic project. You know what I mean? That's a mm -hmm. lot of money. It's a ton. Uh, what I want to know is, did this come from, uh, from Google itself or from Google Ventures or from this mysterious Google Capital thing? I, it's not really clear to me from the uh, filing. I don't know uh, which arm of Google it came from. I'm not sure anybody knows yet, but that is interesting. So Google is the major player in invest the, the most recent billion dollar around in SpaceX. Space is hot. Even Space Google wants to hot. be there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about what else is hot. Apple. So we got a, a look at Apple's financials from last quarter. Last week, they announced their, their quarterly results and they scored the highest profits of any public company on record. That's $18 billion in one quarter that blows everybody else away. But the really intriguing part of this is that according to this research firm, Canaccord, Apple took 93% of all the phone profits worldwide through its iPhone sales. So everybody else who was selling phones like Samsung and HTC and LG, they, they made money, but they did not make profits. They, they had 7% that's product. crazy because Samsung is such a more financially accessible device uh, or has more accessible devices. They're cheaper and they're worldwide probably outselling the iPhone by a substantial margin. But Samsung is not making nearly as much money per unit as Apple is. And there are those who say that, you know, market share really matters because in the long run, Android is going to run everything and it'll be just a tiny, tiny slice of, of iPhone users. That sort of ignores the business reality, which is that Apple's laughing all the way to the bank. Totally. And, you know, honestly, uh, I think another one of our reporters, Emil, did a story recently on some numbers that showed that, you know, Apple's market share is actually growing, it at is least growing, in the yes. U.S. Yes. And so it's true, you know, you can make the prediction that because Samsung has such an affordable device and because Android is everywhere and Google is everywhere that that they'll end up scooping up more of the market and ultimately, you know, more of the money. But I don't know. You know, Apple continues mm. to put out these products that, while expensive, are beautiful and must-haves. I know. And, and there's a case for that, too. There's a question whether they can replicate this quarter after quarter and maybe not because this quarter is show is the first quarter that they were selling the iPhone 6 and and 6 Plus. And the 6 Plus is gigantic, right? So if you were one of those people who just really wants a giant screen, like maybe you're a Galaxy Note user or um, you know, one of the one of the really big screen phones, there was no Apple phone for you until last quarter, and so maybe there was pent up demand for a giant screened iPhone. So maybe they won't sell quite as many next quarter. I don't know. People have made that kind of prediction many times in the past and been proven wrong, though, because Apple just seems to know how to execute right now. Well, it's true, you know, and I think ultimately, and I think we see this like quarter after quarter with Apple, is that it's not just about its ability to raise revenue every quarter and like sell products because they do have downfalls. They have moments where they dip, mm. but I think, you know, they put out 
new spectacular products. That's what they're good at. I mean, even though the phablet, I'm going to call the six plus a phablet, <laughs> is not a new product, you know, right? Samsung's yeah. had it. Other people have had it. Yeah. But it did it differently. It had, you know, the right photography, the right like Gorgeous camera. camera. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it and, did it better. And it's very well integrated into OS X. So I kind of want one now so I can stop commuting with my laptop. I can just use a big screen phone. I mean, I'm getting the six plus. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. See, <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I have to convince certain other members of the family that I live with that <clears throat> it's worth it for me to buy another phone just less than a year after I bought one. But I guess that's what happens when you're a tech reporter. You, you know, you just got to get the latest so that you, you can stay current. Exactly. <laughs> All right, let's talk about another huge news story from the last week. The FCC chairman, Tom Wheeler, had a really interesting uh, open letter published. He did with Wired Magazine. And, you know, Tom Wheeler came through. That's all I have to say. He, <laughs> uh, he really did, though. I mean, so Tom Wheeler suggested in this open letter on Wired Magazine that the Internet be reclassified as a public utility. And this is a major deal because a lot of the carriers, uh, you know, Verizon, AT&T, et cetera, broadband providers have a lot riding on this decision. Now, mm. of course, the open letter doesn't determine a total win. You know, the FCC still has to vote. Right. The chairman doesn't get to call the shots entirely. He's just issuing a recommendation here. Exactly. But, you know, it does hold great promise for mm. the consumer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the reason that this decision especially is such a big deal is because Wheeler for months has been waffling. Yes. He keeps saying, you know, I'm going to take a middle of the road approach. That's going to be my recommendation. I think that there is a way that we can both get the carriers what they want and the consumers what they want. And it doesn't necessarily have to be under Title II. Yes. And, he, uh, you know, he really gave every indication that he wasn't going to go this route at all in his recommendation. So I think a lot of people were pretty excited right. about this open letter. So what this suggests is that the FCC is willing to step in and say to carriers that you have to provide a certain minimum level of internet access to people, individuals, but also to companies without being excessively preferential to the, those with deep pockets like Netflix that are willing to pay for, for prioritized access. Exactly. This whole notion of uh, like two highways, you know, fast lane, slow lane, yep. you know, pay more money and you can get a faster connection and your content will be put ahead of other people's content right. and load times, et cetera. Um, now, so now a certain amount of that already goes on. And it, I mean, obviously what the, what the carriers are going to do is they're going to come back as soon as the FCC passes a regulation like this and they're going to say, they're going to file suit. They're going to say, you don't yeah. understand how the internet works. This is actually damaging to commerce. Well, and they also have this whole idea about how it's somehow unconstitutional and the in a way that internet couldn't possibly qualify as a public utility because right. of X, Y, and Z reasons. They're going to throw the book at it. There's no doubt. Yeah, so, uh, exactly. The story will be going on for quite a while, I'm sure. One more thing to note about this that was really interesting was that it's not just internet. It's also mobile. Ah. So it's like, it's across the board, you know, he yes. made sure to include data access on mobile, which was also interesting because that really fell into a no man's land because it's like, it's your phone, which is qualified under title two, but it's also internet. So, yes. you know, where is this? Anyway, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good point. Well, this will be really interesting to follow in the next few weeks and months as, uh, as this moves through the FCC. And then after that, no doubt through the courts. For all this and more tech news, you know where to go, and that is VentureBeat.com. Before we go to our guest segment in just a minute with Paul Vigna and learn all about cryptocurrency, I want to take a minute to thank our host and sponsor, New Relic, which helps customers make sense of billions of data points about millions of applications in real time. New Relic also has in their lovely offices this studio that we record the, the What to Think podcast every week from. But their main business is not podcasts. It's a comprehensive cloud-based solution that more than 250,000 people use to analyze more than 690 billion data points per day across more than 4 million application instances. Those are applications that developers install the New Relic product into so that they can figure out how things work and whether they're working and uh, get insights into the overall environment of their apps and their websites and more. You can learn more about all that at newrelic.com. And now let's welcome Paul Vigne. He's a markets reporter for the Wall Street Journal covering equities and the economy. And he also writes for the journal's Money Beat blog, co-authors the Daily Bit Beat column with Michael Casey, and anchors the Daily Money Beat show. Paul and Michael are uh, the co-authors 
of a new book, The Age of Cryptocurrency, How Bitcoin and Digital Money Are Challenging the Global Economic Order. Welcome to the show, Paul. Hi, I'm glad to be here. That's a mouthful, that title. Your book takes the really large view, right? You're not just looking at Bitcoin, the phenomenon, but like you see it as a, there's something big going on here in your view, right? Yes, absolutely. And the book really just kind of an outgrowth of the curiosity that Mike and I started getting about the whole subject. We started writing about it for the journal. Honestly, at first, we were both very skeptical at different times in our own ways. But, you know, like a little bug gets in your head about it, and we just kind of kept at it, and then we got very curious. And then we realized that there was a book to be written. So it's almost like a wave hits you, and you realize that this really is a very, very big story. And once we realized that it was a very big story, we wanted to explore just every aspect of it we could. And the book, it's, it's got a narrative flow, but all the chapters kind of stand on their own because we really just wanted to, to dive into different angles of it and look at the history of it and look at economic implications and financial implications and what it means culturally. And we really jumped around quite a lot to get at all that stuff. So, yeah, the title is, it is kind of a mouthful, but there's a lot there. I mean, the Wall Street Journal is not the place you would expect to, to find two reporters diving deep into Bitcoin, right? I mean, I can just see your editors kind of in the early days going like, this crazy thing? So wh what is it that made it, like, come alive for you as a serious topic of, you know, economic discourse as opposed to just some weird fat? We're a financial publication. They see that this is a financial story. Mm. So... It wasn't too much for them to let two reporters kind of do it on the sidelines and write about this as well as everything else we do. So they were actually pretty supportive about it. The thing that first really, really grabbed me was I went to a Bitcoin conference in New York City in the summer of 2013, and I had written about it here and there, but that was the first time that I actually was, was in a room with more than two people who were involved in it. And what really struck me was just the, the feeling that this was a cultural movement. This wasn't just a, a thing. Mm. It wasn't just a, a product. It wasn't just a couple of techies who were excited about some piece of software that somebody had designed. This was a, a cultural movement. I mean, people were identifying themselves through Bitcoin. It was, it was becoming like a badge. Yeah. And I, there was just such tremendous energy in that room you know, that was when I realized that there was something much bigger here. And whether or not Bitcoin became a legitimate thing or not, you know, that, that was a whole other question. But just the fact that people were so enthusiastic about something that was an alternative to existing systems kind of, to me, cast a mirror back on those existing systems, and you realize that there's a flaw. There's something missing that people are going out and seeking this new thing for. So to me, that was the thing. It was really the cultural impact of it that first, first grabbed me as saying there's a bigger story here. So what do you think is the fundamental attraction to Bitcoin? One of the factors that points up to the strength of Bitcoin is the fact that there's no one thing that attracts people to it. And you've seen throughout its history, and even though it's a short history, it's only six and odd years, you've seen people come to it for very, very different reasons. Some people are really attracted by the political implications of it. The idea that you could have a monetary system that is beyond the reach of the banks, beyond the reach of the government, money that can't be confiscated, can't be touched, can't be traced, although we know it can be traced to an extent, you know, the uh, whole encryption, anonymity, right. So some people are really attracted to that. Some people are really attracted to the technical aspects of it, just the fact that this is uh, a system that allows people to Anything that can be digitized can be recorded and sent and stored. Some people are, are just very much, they see it as a, you know, almost like an intellectual, uh, not problem, but almost on intellectual terms, right? Mm -hmm. Purely a technical thing to them. And then you go out to Silicon Valley and there are a lot of people who see a, a, a chance to make some money. And I'm, I'm not saying that like there's anything wrong with that, but you see this entire third wave of people, the VCs, yeah. who start getting involved in it. They see a business opportunity. And right now, I think they're kind of the dominant part of this. I mean, they're the ones that are really driving this. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, they are interested in bringing it into the mainstream. They're interested in taking all the advantages of it and, and spreading that as widely as possible. And they hope to make a little money from that, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so you, you do see these very different people, and it would, it, what makes it a very vibrant thing is that all these different people are bringing their own part to it, and they're all kind of coexisting with each other, and I think it makes it very fascinating. Can you talk a little bit about the business opportunity that's there right now? Because I think that's something that people who sort of like watch Bitcoin broadly don't totally understand. 
You know, it's funny. We went to a, a conference just last night. Hedgeable is a sort of alternative investment firm, and they have these conferences in the city. They focus on Bitcoin. So we were there. Mike actually spoke. I just kind of hung out and it looked pretty. <laughs> <laughs> they, had, they had a few startups there, and they all did. It was like one of those little, uh, it was like one of the expos at the Accelerator. Where everybody gets three minutes, and they do their pitch for the crowd. It's interesting because the opportunities are there, but it's such early days, and it's so hard to figure out which one's going to make it, which ones aren't. In terms of being an investment, I do not think it's something that normal people can invest in yet. Yeah. I mean, you can go out and buy Bitcoin if you want, but that's your only real avenue for it, and we all know how volatile that is. Yeah. Right. You really have to be sort of a VC to, to get into the companies. It's fascinating to watch it from the outside. Uh, I would not want to be investing in it because you don't know who's going to make it and who isn't. Some of the ideas are great, but the execution might be bad. Some of the ideas are bad, but you're very professional people doing it. Yeah, there's such a, a wide divergence of people, and you could see it, too. I mean, we have, I did a whole chapter. I went out to San Francisco in the summer, and we did a whole chapter, basically, on San Francisco and Silicon Valley. And it's so fascinating to see just the young people and the smart people, and not even so young, but just the people who were attracted to this and started thinking up things, you know, who saw Bitcoin and saw the potential and said, oh, my God, I can do something. Yeah. What, what can we do? And they would sit around for 10 hours and just try to sketch out ideas and, well, we could do this, we could do this. We could. So there's a lot of opportunity there, but it's also very, very hard to figure out who's going to make it and who isn't overall. It's one thing if, uh, if you know, your photo sharing network doesn't execute very well, but it's another thing altogether if your bank doesn't execute very well. And, you know, in the last year or two, we've seen lots and lots of cases of Bitcoin storage companies yep. like Mt. Gox get hacked, enormous right. amounts of Bitcoin be stolen. You know, Mt. Gox right. is now right. out of business. It feels a little bit like the bank out west and at any moment outlaws could come, you know, galloping down the street with six guns firing and raid the safe, you know? I think two things, and I want to say what would be the second thing first, actually, is you are seeing some companies start to grow up. Mm. Coinbase, blockchain, Circle, you know, you are seeing some companies that are better funded, have better management teams. You are starting to see them emerge. Mm -hmm. But your point about, about Mt. Gox is very well taken, and it's a very good illustration of it. You know, it was started by one guy, Jed McCaleb, who people in the industry know, very smart guy, but seems to have this habit of starting businesses and then just kind of getting bored and selling them and moving on. So he sells it to Mark Carpalis, the Frenchman, who was a smart guy, I'm sure, but a terrible finance guy. He was not prepared to run what is essentially a Forex exchange. He was mm -hmm. not ready to do that. So the business was awful. I mean, in a lot of ways, Mt. Gox was good because it, you know, really kind of became the first platform for people to get involved in Bitcoin. But it was such a terrible platform. It was so destined to fail. <laughs> and now all anybody knows is Mt. Gox. And they say, oh, Mt. Gox, Mt. Gox. And unfortunately, it's a kind of catchy name, so it sticks in people's heads. Yeah. And they think, oh, Mt. Gox, oh, that was a terrible thing. So Mt. Gox paints the entire Bitcoin industry when it, it really shouldn't. And the, the kind of company it was when it was formed, again, it was terribly formed. Carpalis was not ready to set up an exchange. The companies that have come since are much better formed. They have better managed teams, smarter people, but everybody kind of lives with that stain of Mt. Gox. I, it's easy to say that in retrospect, right? Because with something like Bitcoin that is not fully understood by a lot right. of people, it's very hard to evaluate and tell what the difference is between a Coinbase and a Mt. Gox until something bad happens. Well, I would say, I mean, from my experience being a journalist, the first thing I would notice is that Mt. Gox was impossible to get in touch with. You could never talk to anybody. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You would send an email, and it would take a week and a half to get a reply. That definitely raises a red flag when you, you're reporting on somebody and they won't return calls. Right. And apparently, from what everything I've heard, their consumer relations were just as bad. So, and you, listen, you still see Bitcoin companies like that. I mean, yeah. when you don't know who the person is and you can't get in touch with them, that, that's a red flag. It's funny. Mt. Gox is absolutely a stain, um, and they definitely scared the general public for sure and, and, and as far as Bitcoin yeah. is concerned. But what kind of investment did we see in 2014 in Bitcoin startups? It was like hundreds of millions. Like, you know, the, people are putting money in. So there's obviously some thought that it will succeed to a certain extent. Oh, yeah. it was. I think it was about $97 million in 2013. It was 300 and. 15 or 330 million in 2014. Wow. Exactly. And I think we're already over 100 million this year. I mean, Coinbase had a huge 75 million round of funding. So 
the VCs are pouring money into it. Let's not kid ourselves. That is a still a small stream of overall venture capital world. Right. But in percentage terms, it is growing. Then you have more and more sort of serious money coming into it, and they're looking for returns. You know, they're they're yeah. not they're taking gambles. They understand that, but they're not just throwing the money away. They want returns, so they're looking for people who know what they're doing. Again, to my original point, it is still very early days, and it's very hard to know who's going to make it and who isn't in the long run. So it's still a very, very speculative field to be investing in. Let me ask you about another thing that was in the news in the last week or so, which I, I think might be a, a stain or a, you know raise questions about, the, about Bitcoin, and that's the, the Silk Road verdict. Um, Ross Ulbrich yeah. was convicted of being, quote-unquote, dread pirate Roberts, Right. mastermind behind the Silk Road uh, drug trading hub or whatever sure. you call it. And one of the ways that they pinned this on him was by examining the Bitcoin blockchain. And they were able to trace tens of thousands right. of transactions back to his laptop. So right. that sort of gives a lie to the idea that Bitcoin is anonymous because in this case, at least every transaction is logged in, in the blockchain publicly. And in this case, they were able to trace it back to that individual. But also right. it highlights the kind of potential for, let's say, you know, extra legal uses of a, of a currency like yeah. this. So, yeah, does that change the picture at all? I think it does a little bit. The thing with Ulbricht, what they had was, and it's, I guess it's, you know, a lot of people say it's still kind of sketchy about how the FBI got their hands on the Silk Road servers, mm. which they found overseas. But they got the servers, then they arrested Ulbricht, and when they arrested him, they got his laptop. And once they had those two ends of the transactions, it was literally just a mechanical process to replay the transactions, and they had everything, and they had yeah. everything on him. Once they got those two ends, and that's the real trick. Okay, so if, if they didn't have those... It would have been a lot harder. Yeah, okay. Because your accounts are encrypted. Your identity is encrypted. It's not impossible to figure out who somebody is. And if you can get that other information, and then you have the blockchain record on top of it... I mean, it becomes a slam dunk case. Mm -hmm. Your larger point is right. This idea that you are absolutely protected forever and no one will ever find you. I mean, Ross Ulbricht showed that that's not exactly the case. But if you're just kind of a general person, you want to go onto Silk Road or one of the other dark websites that sells drugs and you want to buy whatever and pay for it in Bitcoin, chances are it's going to be a lot harder to find you. Okay. And, and that, I don't think, goes away. But I don't think it's an absolute that it can't be found, and the Albert trial certainly showed that. Yeah. The Albert trial brings up sort of this whole, you know, Dylan, you mentioned this whole stain concept. And, you know, the other thing I'm really curious about, and, and actually you mentioned earlier, is uh, Jed McCaleb, who started Mac Gox and then sold it, and now has a new company called Stellar which is another form of cryptocurrency. And I'd love to know what you think of that and sort of the other cryptocurrencies that are out there, like Ripple, and sort of what place you think they hold, if they have a chance of survival, or yeah. if you think they're just, you know, whatever, you know, just another thing yeah. out there competing with the big thing. It's funny, because Mike and I, we go back and forth about this among ourselves, about whether it'll be Bitcoin or whether the others or an altcoin. I think it's funny because Stellar got a lot of Stellar. I haven't really heard anything about them lately, and I've kind of been in my own bubble world with the books. I haven't talked to them. We wrote about them when they first launched it. Uh, so I don't really know what's up with them. I know it's still out there, but I haven't been hearing a lot about it, so I don't know how much traction it's getting. This is the thing. Bitcoin has a huge advantage over every other altcoin. It has the most money going into it. It has the most attention. It has the most users, the most merchants. I mean, it is by far the largest, and in terms of having a critical mass compared to any of the other altcoins, it, it definitely has that critical mass. It has the first mover advantage. I mean, all the, it's got all those things going for it. Does that alone guarantee that Bitcoin will be the one that makes it? No, it doesn't. But what I think is very interesting is that you could have a world where, look, in the real world, we have multiple currencies. You have the dollar, you have the euro, you have the yen, you have the Swiss franc, you have hundreds of currencies. I do think that in the future, we're going to end up with a world where it's not just Bitcoin. It's not just Stellar or just Ethereum or any of the other. I've actually, most of the other altcoins, I don't think have any chance whatsoever. But Ethereum, Ripple, Stellar, Bitcoin, Litecoin, you know, all those have a chance to, to capture some sustainable business, say that. I personally think Bitcoin is going to be the one that is, remains number one in the major 
digital currency. But it doesn't mean that just because Bitcoin is out there that those others can't. Ripple has a very interesting business case, which Seller kind of has the same way. You know, this idea that they're going to sell that product as a sort of back service function for banks. Mm. That's a very interesting use case. And, and they could make a business off that. So you could have... Ripple exists, and you can have Bitcoin exist. They could be on parallel tracks. So the, it, it's not a consumer product. It's a it's something that banks would use to settle with each other right. to do international right. transfers. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And it's the difference between using Bitcoin as a currency versus using it as an asset, which I think is something you also talked about in your book, isn't it? We, we talk about it a lot. And you're starting to see that, too. Even some of the Bitcoin the service providers, Circle, certainly, Policy Miners, Bit Reserve. Uh, even BitPesa, which is a remittance uh, startup in Kenya, you know they're using Bitcoin as the rails for their business, but they're not making a huge point out of being a quote-unquote Bitcoin business. And they're allowing you to have your accounts denominated in whatever your home currency is. Hmm. So they're using Bitcoin, but they're not a quote-unquote Bitcoin business, which is, is not a bad way to see Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a tool. And I think this is going to become more and more of psychology behind it. In the early days, Bitcoin was this mysterious, weird thing out of nowhere, and it was very speculative and very mysterious and very anti-authoritarian, and, and it built up a, a sort of mythology around it because of that. As it goes on, I really think you're going to start to see Bitcoin as a utilitarian thing, as a tool, as something people can use to help facilitate commerce, which is what any currency really is. Mm -hmm. As that happens... I think Bitcoin becomes more valuable in a real sense, but it becomes less valuable in a speculative sense. It becomes less valuable in a great nifty new thing sense. It just becomes yeah. a product. It becomes a tool, which is a good thing. I think actually the day Bitcoin gets really boring is the day it actually probably becomes solidified in our daily lives. Yeah, it, it does seem like the, the, its volatility would have to subside a lot before um, people would feel really comfortable using it regularly. Right. But it's interesting that the, the picture you're painting is one of a future where we're not necessarily going to be, you know, paying for Bitcoin to get a soda out of the, the Bitcoin-enabled soda machine down the hall, but more like we might use it and not even know we're using it because the service that we're using to wire money back to our parents right. and the home country uses Bitcoin under the hood, mm -hmm. but we're putting in dollars and, you know, pesos are coming out the other end and we don't even have to think about it. It very much could. And, and again, all of this is up in the air. You know, this is an experiment. It could collapse completely. I mm -hmm. don't think it will. I do think that, that the future is going to involve digital currencies, but I do think that that's a very likely case that cryptocurrencies in general, digital currencies in general, mm -hmm. will become something that we use in our daily lives and we may not even know it. Mobile banking is going to become a big deal. Mobile wallets, people that have wallets on their phones, that's going to become a big deal. And the best system for that is Bitcoin. Is it's built as a digital system. I mean, and we, we say this in the book, and I think it's really true. The best way to think of Bitcoin is it's digital money for a digital age. Fast, simple, clean, efficient system. And once people realize that, I, I do think it is going to slowly seep its way into our daily lives. We're just about out of time, so I, I want to leave it on that note. It's a really interesting look at the future of Bitcoin, and I think you know you and Michael Casey have done an awful lot of thinking on this. So thank you very much for taking time to join us today on What to Think. Yeah, no, thanks. I, look, I read you guys a lot, so I was, I'm happy to get a chance to talk to you. That's great to hear. The book is The Age of Cryptocurrency by Paul Vigna and Michael J. Casey. You can find it on Amazon and I'm sure other bookstores. We will uh, post a link on the podcast post on VentureBeat.com. And as always, you can find us in iTunes and on Stitcher and on our website. Just search for What to Think and uh, you'll find us there. And we'll catch you next week. <laughs>